Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good to have you here with us today as we study. We have been doing a study in Daniel, but uh, we are stepping aside from that for a couple weeks, possibly three, uh, to talk about matters of Christmas. And so welcome to you in our study. This is for December 17th, 2023, but you can listen to it anytime you wish. And uh, our topic is a two-parter. Why did God do Christmas the way he did? You know, it was kind of interesting when I married my wife some 50 years ago, and I suddenly find out that there's different traditions that people have, different ways of doing Christmas than what I was used to. And... Uh, uh, there wasn't uh, particularly one better than the other. It was just the way they did Christmas. And some of it had meaning and some of it was tradition. And uh, so uh, they they had their reasons. Some of them were good. Some of them were just happenstance. But when it comes to why did Christ, why did God do Christmas the way he did, I rather think there were some pretty good reasons. And so it's just a way of compiling the information and putting it together in a way that uh, would be memorable. And so let's start out on this. Why did God do Christmas the way he did? And I have three questions. Why did he choose a humble carpenter's family? Why did God have Jesus born in a manger? And why did God choose shepherds to witness the event? So we all know that it was a humble carpenter's family. We all know that Jesus was born in a manger. We all know that shepherds witnessed the event. But but why did he choose to do it that way? And of course, uh, it was the very best way, because God doesn't make any mistakes. And uh, we're going to kind of look behind the scenes and see if we can think through these things and come up with some good reasons. Uh, that's become apparent. So why did he choose a humble carpenter's family? And uh, I would just have to say, number one, that God loves humble, hardworking, righteous people. Uh, that's what Joseph and Mary were. They didn't have aspirations to be a king, although... Joseph was of the line of David and of the royal line. The royal line was ruined by Jeconiah or Coniah. And uh, the Lord said, even if he was a signet ring on my finger, I'd rip it off. And uh, so no one from the direct seed of Coniah could be king. Well, that disqualified Joseph, even though the royal lineage was through him. But he could, Jesus could be through the line of Mary, who was of the line of David, and would be inherit the royal line. So he wasn't of the seed of Coniah, but he had the rights to the throne. Kind of interesting how that worked out. But Joseph was a humble man. He was a carpenter, and Mary was a rather young lady, and she was righteous in herself, just very humble, not having high aspirations, wanting to have a family, wanting to be uh, believers and faithful uh, to the faith that they had, which was the correct one. And uh, so... They didn't have a lot of aspirations, but just to raise a humble family and live their lives and the blessings that a man and wife cooperating together would have as they follow their faith together. And God wanted his son in the hands of a blue-collar family. Uh, Jesus wasn't born in a palace. Jesus wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Even though he had 
the riches of the universe at his disposal when he was up there and at the throne of God, second person of the Godhead. He didn't clamor to hold on to that. Oh, I can't give up this. I can't give up of that. No, no. You mean I have to become a baby? Oh, no. No. God put uh, his son, the most precious possession in the world, the most valuable person that ever lived, put that child into the hands of Joseph and Mary, just two humble people trying to follow the Lord. And uh, so if the Magi came and wanted to worship this child that was born, when they went to the palace, he wasn't there. No, no. He was born over in a manger. He was born over in some barn or cave someplace. And so God wanted Jesus to be with humble people, with poor people. And God wanted people of faith that are not overcome with their own sophistication and agenda. Have you met people that think that they're better than somebody else because they drive a fancy certain car? Now, you can drive a fancy certain car if you want, but if you think that makes you better than somebody else, I think God's got an argument with you. And so it is. we are not made better. We are not shown to be superior by the accoutrements of life. But uh, a man who has an honest heart, a man who uh, tells the truth, his handshake is his bond. Um, he's gentle. He's loving. He's dependable. He's faithful. That's what God wants. And uh, so here he's going to interrupt the plans of a humble maid and a humble carpenter. And we see this, first of all, when uh, Mary is approached in Luke chapter 1 and verse 34. And it says right here, uh, Mary said to the angel, who appeared to her, how can this be since I am a virgin? I mean, he said, you're going to bear a son and all this sort of thing. And she says, well, how can this be? I, I don't even, I haven't even known a man. Uh, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. I like that God used the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has never appeared having a body. Um, a dove, um, fire, water, wind but never a man. And so he, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And uh, it, later on, we find out Joseph was going to divorce her because she was with child and he knew it wasn't her, his. And the angel said to him, take the child, take Mary as your wife. Um, the child is pure and holy. There's no sex involved. It was by the Holy Spirit. And it says that Joseph kept her a virgin until after the child was born. It was truly a virgin birth. And um, there was no sexual encounter. You know, there's a major religion in the United States that seems to think that the Heavenly Father came down and slept with Mary while she was married to Joseph. I call that adultery. And, and, and of course, that didn't happen. But nevertheless, uh, these people are not concerned about the facts of the Bible. I am. And so she was a virgin. There was no sex. There was a miracle going on. And, and so she was going to become with child. And yet, things had to be worked out with Joseph. So he'd buy into this and understand. And uh, so he said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. 
the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God, of the order of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. That was considered a miracle. She was past the age of bearing children. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. So that was given to Mary to help her understand that what they were telling her about her being with child, even though she never knew a man, was possible because God also did this for Elizabeth. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She accepted it. She didn't say, well, now, wait a minute. This isn't according to how I planned things. Um, I'm not sure how all this is going to work out. I need to have this all punched out and written down for me. I know she just humbly said, okay, I'll accept this. She understood that this was an angelic force before her, that these things were, there was a unique privilege and the details would be worked out by God. She didn't know how, but she just trusted on it. Now that is a young lady who did not insist upon her agenda. She, she, what she wanted was God's will for her life. That's in short supply these days. And sometimes we have to have people who will just say, I don't know how God's going to do this. I don't know why he's going to do this, perhaps. But whatever it is he has for me and his will, I'll accept it. Incredible. Well, now, we turn over to Joseph. And uh, here he was, just a humble man, a carpenter that wanted to start a family and, uh, you know, have some children and care for them and his wife and just have the joy of the marriage and uh, two people working together. And he had his dreams. And all of a sudden, he finds out when Mary came back from visit, visiting Elizabeth, that lo and behold, she was with child. And it says here in verse 19 of Matthew 1, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, plan to send her away secretly. That means divorce her. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Jesus. That's Joshua in Hebrew. So Joseph was willing to accept what God imposed upon him. That God, knowing the qualities of Joseph, came to him and put this upon this young couple. And here's something, because of their custom of already having been married, although they did not come together, Jesus was conceived inside of marriage. And so, my friends, all the details have worked out. Mary's lineage and Joseph's lineage are both right there. They go, Both of them go back to the line of David. One is the royal line, the other is just a 
faithful line of uh, relationship to David traced back to him. And he chose a humble carpenter's family uh, because Jesus was going to be very, very humble as well. So why did he choose a humble carpenter's family? God loves humble, hardworking people. God wanted his son in the hands of a blue-collar family. These weren't highly educated people, but yet they had the skills necessary to raise their son in a godly fashion. God wanted people of faith that weren't overcome by their own sophistication and agenda. Secondly, why did God have Jesus born in a manger? Now, the short answer is because that was part of the sign. You know, here is the God of the universe, and he is born in quite possibly the most humble circumstances that could be on this earth. In Luke chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 12, as they're talking to the, uh, the shepherds, and the announcement is, the Savior who is Christ the Lord, verse 12, this will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And uh, it kind of helped that this had come. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. So, I mean, the angels couldn't contain themselves. They were permitted to show out. And they sang in unison these words that they'd been itching to say for millennium. And now they said it, and and the shepherds saw this. It must have been awe-inspiring. And then they, when the angels had gone away, verse 15, from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go immediately to Bethlehem then. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Oh, that would have been great to be one of those shepherds. And so, most kings are born in palaces. But the world didn't even have any space for Jesus. No room for you in the end. Oh, we don't have any room. There's not a place. You know, the rooms back at that time, <laughs> the hotels, they weren't the Holiday Inn. They weren't the Ramada Inn. They weren't the Marriott or the Hilton. I mean, they'd have a big room and people would sleep on the floor or stretched out however they could. You know, imagine trying to give birth in a place like that with all these people around. In some ways, God in his wisdom gave her a, a very private place. It might have been some nice straw there. Could have been dry, of course. But also, just remember, it was like a barn. You know, I raise chickens. I have a big enough coop you can walk into it. But believe me, friends, you got to watch your step. And there's manure all over, and it can smell a little bit, especially in the summertime. And uh, these birds are in there and laying their eggs. And my friends, Jesus was born in a lowly, lowly place. Uh, there are people who wouldn't want to set foot in a place like that. They think they're dirty or whatever. And so, uh, here was Jesus, and he was born in a cave, or a barn, or a lean-to. And they placed him in a manger. Now, when I was a young man, uh, and I said, away in a manger, you no know, crib for a bed. I didn't really understand all that. I thought the, the little lean-to that they have in these creches 
I thought that that was the manger. I didn't know that that actually is this X wood thing that has food for the animals. It just holds food. And they put straw in there. It'd be akin to people so poor that their child is born in a box or they open up the one of the lower drawers on their bureau and the baby sleeps in there. I mean, this was humble, friends. And so the world had no space for him. He certainly didn't come with a silver spoon in his mouth, not like a king. Our Lord was coming as a servant. And there's a passage of scripture is found in Philippians chapter 2. And uh, this, this is actually written to try and help two ladies, Yodi and Sintika, get along and to have this attitude in themselves. It says here in Philippians 2 and verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. No, I'm not going to go down there. No, I'm not going to live as a humble servant. I'm not going to be born in a manger. I'm not going to be poor. I'm not going to give up all this stuff and go down and do that at, in that filthy sinful place with all of these sinners he said I'll do it I'll do it and he gave up everything for us and he emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It was just the most despicable way that man could ever be killed. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. For all that he gave up, and all the humility and all the embarrassment and all of the indignities and taking upon himself our penalty that he didn't deserve. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth. It wasn't just all about what we thought. It was also what the people in heaven thought. And they said, he gave up all this to go down there to redeem this, this despicable, traitorous people. And every knee shall bow and tongue confess him. Uh, and, and as Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So quite, quite remarkable. And, you know, people get all caught up about their glory and their legacy and how they're going to be remembered. And our Lord had an interesting thing that he said here when he was talking with the disciples. Um, verse 24 of Matthew 20. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers, James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So why did God have Jesus born in the manger? Friends, it was a full on symbol of the humility and the servanthood and how humble the Lord is and what he had done. Thirdly, why did God choose shepherds to witness the event? I believe it's because, or at least one of the reasons, our Savior's heart was that of a shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isaiah testified, all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for my sheep, and no one can snatch them out of my hands. The hireling sees the wolf come, and he deserts the flock, but I lay my life down for them. So he says, I am the good shepherd. And uh, so he says, the heart of God is to leave the 90 and 9 and go look for the one lost sheep. So he was a shepherd's heart at a heart. And such men, shepherds, who witnessed this event, wouldn't mind going to a stable. You know, some people say, huh, I, I'm not going to go to some dirty stable. Now, I have a church full of farmers that raise cattle and pigs and turkeys and, and all kinds of animals. And they work hard and uh, have horses. And, and these people are right down to earth. And I'll tell you, you raise animals and you have to deal with what comes out the back end and you have to clean up and you have to feed them and take care of them. And these animals are ornery. And my friends, um, it grounds you. And uh, such men as uh, the shepherds, they wouldn't mind going to some stable to see this event. They were faithful down to earth and acquainted with sacrifice. It says in Luke chapter 2 that they were tending their flocks by night and they were going to stay out in the field all night. Um, they, they would build uh, uh, little corrals with stones and then they'd put the sheep inside and they would take... Uh, uh, thorns and put them on top of these rocks that they put around so that the animals couldn't leap over that and then they'd have one opening and they'd sleep right in that opening they were the door and you remember Jesus said I am the door and nothing comes in and goes out except through me and so they were faithful, down-to-earth people that didn't mind camping out at night under the stars, warmed by just a fire, taking care of the sheep, not sleeping in the house, but out there where the sheep could be, have easy access the next day to faraway fields. And they were used to roughing it. So they were faithful down-to-earth and acquainted with sacrifice men who would lay their lives down for the sheep. Remember David who uh, killed a bear and also a lion that was attacking the sheep. He took them on. And uh, these men were like that. And uh, our Lord uh, was revealing things to them. These hardworking men, men who weren't lettered, men who couldn't read, men who were rather down to earth. And it says here that uh, they could recognize a lamb when they saw one. So why did God choose shepherds to witness the event? Our Savior's heart 
was that of a shepherd. Such men wouldn't mind going to a stable. They were faithful down to earth and acquainted with sacrifice, and they could recognize a lamb when they saw it. Now, so here they saw this baby lying in a manger. They knew that that was a sign from God. And they were, they felt extremely privileged that God would allow them to see this. And they told it all abroad to the common people and everyone that would listen. And the question that comes down to us is, just as the shepherds could recognize a lamb when they saw one. Uh, that's kind of a metaphor for, can you recognize the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, when you hear about him? And can you see his worth? And have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? 